Uh, hey everybody, Scott McLeod here, and look who I have with me. It's Katie Martin. I'm so excited. Me too. <laughs> um, for the very small handful of you who for some reason know me but don't know Katie, Katie's done a lot of amazing things in her life. Uh, one of the things is that she wrote this cool book called Learner-Centered Innovation, which everybody should have on their bookshelf. So if you don't have that yet, get that and read that. It's all about sparking curiosity and igniting passion and it's a phenomenal book. And so I tweeted Katie and just said, hey, Katie, want to set up a time to informally chat? And she was foolish enough to say yes. And here we are. <laughs> Smart enough, I say. There's so much I have to learn and always love talking to you, Scott. Thanks, Katie. Well, and I just feel very privileged because you're always so busy and I just feel like I have this, I have you all to myself right now. And that's pretty exciting. Um, so, Katie, obviously the big thing in everybody's mind is what's happening this fall, right? Right. Um, so, uh, what are you hearing? Uh, I hear a lot of uncertainty. Um, a lot of just need to meet people where they are. There's, you know, the tension between bringing kids back to school because we want them to focus on their social emotional health and we want to make sure that kids are taken care of and that families can get back to work. But we're also, of course, um, very nervous about health concerns. Uh, and so in that, what I'm also hearing is just a focus on checking the box. We were just saying curriculum, like let's make sure we have all of these things tied up because as hard as everybody worked in the spring, and like, it was literally this like Herculean effort. There was a great New York Times piece about that. Um, but it, it didn't meet the needs of everybody. People were struggling and it, was, um, it wasn't it was um, as organized as it typically is in the classroom. And so a lot of people were stressed. And Bye, <laughs> there's my son. <laughs> and, then, and then you have lots of things like that of kids who just like when you're working and kids come and go because um, you can't do it all at once. Um, so the need for the fall to have a better plan, to be more structured, and people are focusing on that. And I think the thing that you and Scott, you Scott, were focused on is, yes, we need a plan. Yes, we need structure. But it didn't work just because we didn't have the right curriculum digitized. In a lot of ways, it didn't work because it wasn't authentic, it wasn't meaningful, and it didn't provide kids opportunities to engage in things that they really wanted to be focused on. And so we find that when kids are taken out of the classroom, it's much harder to make them do work than it typically is in the classroom, and parents now had visibility in that. And so that's what we're really wrestling with. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, you said a lot in there, Katie, that's worth unpacking. I think a couple of things for me. One is, um, you know, I've been interviewing the school leaders all across the world about how they've been responding to the pandemic since March. You know, I just did my 43rd interview. Um, and, they're so awesome. And I'm so oh glad God. that you're cataloging that. It's been really, really helpful. Thank you very much. I'm sort of in the sense making part of it now, right? Like, what are the mm -hmm. big themes that are coming together? That's the university professor in me. Um, but, you know, over and over again, I think what we saw was that even in schools that were doing some interesting learning before the pandemic hit, they kind of reverted back in the spring because they were in survival mode. And we sort of saw this reversion back to lowest denominator learning, right? Like, okay, we're really struggling right now. We, all of our kids don't have access and our teachers haven't been trained in the technology tools and platforms. And the best we can do right now is sort of like, you know, worksheets and homework like that good stuff paper or electronic, and we're going to get it out as quick as we can, and we're just going to kind of do that, and that's, and they just sort of never, most places never got past that, and so some of it was access, right, because it was the kind of stuff you could run off on paper, shove it in a backpack, run it home on the bus, or have the family can pick up at the school if they didn't have a device or bandwidth, but for, but for the other teachers, right, who weren't trained in anything more robust pedagogically or technologically, they also reverted back to that, even when they did more interesting stuff before then. I don't know, do you agree with me? A hundred percent. I don't even know where to start. So <laughs> one of the things, um, when when the pandemic uh, you know, hit, I would say, it was, it was a slow burn, but in March, when we all had to immediately um, move school online, I was teaching a graduate course of educators who were very progressive 
and who are known for being very, you know, teach project-based learning and authentic experiences. And they too were struggling to say, we're, we're known for this in person, but we don't know how to do this in an online environment. And, and so they did, they acknowledged the lowest denominator of learning. It went very quickly from authentic, meaningful learner agency to we're going to get in the classroom. We're going to focus on here's your grammar, you know, packet, here's your reading, here's your math worksheet. And, and they were frustrated too. And, and I think what we're seeing is this like busy work and equating for amount of time sitting in front of a worksheet or a teacher is what we're equating now to what we used to equate to seat time. So if I can see you doing amount of work for a certain time or you can turn in assignments, then I feel like I've done my job, but it's much harder to track um, and understand the learning when it's authentic, like we did in the classroom. Right, and you know, I, yeah, 100%. And you know, I wrote a blog post recently where I said that that might have been okay in the spring because it was sort of survival mode and our families gave us grace. But now we've had the summer to do something different. And, you know, they're not going to give us the same grace all next school year. We're living in that kind of modality. Um, they're going to look for something richer and more robust and more meaningful and more relevant. And to be honest, just more engaging, right? Like I've been telling people, like, if we're not designing for higher engagement learning this fall, we're doomed. I mean, you think about all the kids that ghosted us or checked out yeah. um, in the spring and it's going to be twice as bad in the fall and families are going to start hollering if that's the best that we can do again and it yeah. you know maybe you disagree with me but it just feels like a lot of school systems have sort of ignored what's been happening in terms of the virus and the pandemic and the cases in the area and there's like this magical thinking that they're going to go back to school face to face and they didn't plan for remote again and now all of a sudden they're going remote again Right, and so the likelihood of replicating what happened in the spring this fall is going to be very high in a lot of places because they didn't plan for it. Yeah, I, I think that's a hundred percent right. That there's there hasn't been planning. There has been this hope that we were just going to go back in the fall and that it would just be okay, and we were only going to really think about distance learning for a small number of families who wouldn't come back. And now we're in this place. All of a sudden oh no, we have to plan for everybody. We weren't prepared for this, right? And we were just reeling from the spring and, and educators need a break. My gosh, we all need a break, right? So please don't take this as, right, as right. trouble if you didn't take a break. Sure. Um, but what you're saying, Scott, is the need for engagement. But the problem is, again, we're going back to engagement means doing work. And the lowest level of that is that I can provide a curriculum that checks the boxes and, and it's all online and I'm going to make you do it now because a lot of people think the problem in the spring was we didn't do grades. So they think that the problem with the lack of engagement was not the activities or the world around us. It was because we didn't assign grades and therefore kids didn't care. And so now we're bringing back the hammer in a lot of places to say, well, it's going to be different in the fall because we're going to grade this. We're going to check your, your time on task. And we think that that's going to shift engagement. And a lot of kids are going to say, nope, that's, that's not it. And we're going to lose people. And that's my fear is that we're going to lose people and we're going to have people say, see, public education, it's not working. And we really can, as educators, really rethink how we how we do things to meet the needs of learners at home hybrid or in our classrooms and it really i've been thinking how do we do this and focus on learning anytime anywhere not just in these discrete environments and and so i think that i really want us to look forward and and figure out like you said those authentic experiences get kids engaged um, and you and I both have shared this graphic often. I actually use this graphic in presentations all the time, but the Gallup engagement poll in 2016 that really showed from fifth grade to 12th grade, the just dramatic decline in engagement for students. So by the time they're in 12th grade, 12th graders don't feel like they're engaged. They don't feel like they're something that they do well. They don't feel like they have fun at school. And that happens from fifth grade on. We know this happens in school. We have all of a sudden like done this like Jedi mind trick that like school now is all this place where kids are engaged and, and motivated and at home is not, right? 
And, yeah. and so, and then the, um, the poll just came out with youth truth that said kids, you know, the same amount of kids essentially were disengaged at home. And we're not making that connection that our kids have been disengaged no matter where we are because of the way that we have mandated curriculum, pacing, learning experiences in too many cases. So it's not about how to do school at home. It's about how to like mix things up and do it better for all kids. Yeah, nicely said. And, and I appreciate you sticking up for our poor tired teachers over the summer, right? Because they're embedded within systems and they're embedded within communities and policies and so on. Um, you know, I think one of the things we're seeing um, is that, you know, you mentioned the low engagement that we had even before the pandemic, right? And, and we're, that was quite evident. Um, you know, but students were willing to exchange that sort of uninspiring learning for other things. Like yeah. they got to come to school and see their friends. They had clubs and activities and athletics and fine arts. They felt like they were part of a caring community or a teacher who looked after them, right? Like there was these other things that brought them to school. And it was like, I'm willing to exchange my boring learning for those things. And I'll kind of play the game of school and I'll kind of get by. I mean, most of them, right? Mm -hmm. So, But then all those motivators got paired away when we went remote. And the only thing that was left was the uninspiring learning. <laughs> yeah. I mean, so, so true. And I, and, and I want to just, there are so many educators doing a great job. And this is not to say like, you know, as a teacher, I certainly had my moments where I, have done things well and you know continue to, to figure out how to do things better um, but when we when we think about the learning environment itself that's one of the things this push to get kids back to school I am 100% I have two young kids who are going to be in fifth grade and sixth grade my daughter is like this is not how I imagined starting middle school um, but at the same time we can't fool ourselves that going back is going to include those things you know, I've seen pictures of going back and, you know, you can't, you can't come near people, you're wearing a mask, and we need to do these things for safety. But this is an environment where educators were going to be stressed out because they want to keep kids away from each other. The kids are going to be stressed out because there's new protocols and procedures. And so this push to get kids back in the building just for their social emotional well-being, I don't think is exactly accurate either. Now, there are kids who need to be in the care of adults in buildings because their parents aren't home right. and because they need the support. And I really want to advocate. I read a great article this morning that some kids need to be in school and most need to stay home. Yes. And, and so I think we need to really be thinking about that, not, the, you know, a, not an either or approach, but how do we get kids who need to be in buildings and cared for, get them first and have a tiered approach and then really think about what matters most, right? Like I just keep going back to what are the things that matter most? What are the experiences that we wanna really focus on for kids? Because we can't do all the things that we were doing pre-pandemic um, and do them well. Yeah, absolutely. And some of the pictures I've seen of like, here's the teacher's desk with these clear shower curtains around it, hanging from PVC pipe. And you know, it's like an elementary classroom. Like what do you can do with your you know, fourth grader in the back row? So <laughs> all this stuff is nuts. Yeah. Um, so Katie, uh, you and I have both been strong advocates for high engagement, deeper learning uh, in schools and classrooms and other experiences for a really long time. Uh, what have you been working on this summer? Uh, I imagine you didn't take the summer off. No, God, summer, <laughs> no. I, it, the break did not happen. So I, I feel that I need that break too. Um, I have been doing a combination of reading and writing and you know at altitude we are trying to think about our best way to support partners and so we have a, a variety of partners public charter independent and so we've been thinking about how to support more authentic learning provide projects and resources that that educators can use i think that's one of the um most glaring parts for me. I used to be as a teacher in the classroom, like every teacher can create their own curriculum. Don't give me anything. I want to design for my own kids. And then you realize that's not sustainable or it's, it doesn't raise the bar of high quality instruction for um, all kids. So trying to think about how we provide, you know, raise the floor on good quality projects that educators can use and build from and, um, and create in their own context. 
So working on with the team on that a lot and, um, and just trying to provide professional learning for people um, to shift thinking around what's possible instead of, instead of um, kind of the lower level learning like we're talking about. Yeah, absolutely. So Katie, what does some of that pro professional learning look like? Because we know we have a lot of teachers who were maybe more traditional, right, in their modalities before the pandemic hit, and now you're talking about trying to get them to do live in deeper learning modalities and possibly remote. So yeah. how, do you, how do you help teachers who, to make that sort of larger leap? Well, one of the things I really strongly believe and continue to advocate is that teachers create what they experience. So creating professional learning opportunities that aren't just about telling people, right? There are, we've certainly had summits and things like that where we've shared, but, but really engaging people um, in a, learning something, trying to like build community, understand, share collectively, try some things out, start building, and then synthesize learning. So it's a, the synchronous and asynchronous learning experience, I think is this dynamic that is very different from the classroom. And so really trying to elevate what's better in a synchronous environment, what's better asynchronous, and then create that professional development for teachers where they can experience that themselves. Um, and, and so we're working a lot on that. And then the other thing is really just helping people understand what went well in the fall or in the spring. Yeah. There are things we learned, there's a lot that came out of that. So trying to elevate that for people to kind of solve their own problems and really identify those bright spots, then figure out what was challenging so that they can then figure out, okay, given what we know, what do we have to do differently in the fall? Because I could go around with a list of do all these things and it, it doesn't necessarily matter, but when people make sense of it in their own communities, they own it and, and can really start um, making decisions. So we've just been doing a lot of support in that, like consulting and guidance for people to make, make those decisions in their own community. Very cool. So I just wrapped up over the last two weeks, I've done three almost week long uh, virtual workshops for educators in Virginia. And so we okay. have the leadership team strand from some of the um, lead innovation districts that are part of the big um, Virginia's for Learners Network innovation yep. academy that's happening out there with the new graduate profile. They're um, doing amazing work out there. It's really cool to see what's happening. They are, and it, and they're one of the few state departments that have really taken the lead on sort of a future ready profile of a graduate and is trying to really help school systems make that happen. So I've been part of that since um, since the first cohort last year, and it's been really rewarding work. Uh, but they also gave me two groups of uh, one strand of elementary educators and one strand of secondary educators. And there were somewhere between 70 and 100 in each. Um, and, you know, so I've been using the four shifts protocol to redesign yep. things with them. And so it's been Which a everyone should be using, by the way. <laughs> Thanks. It's free. Um, yep. uh, just go to bit.ly slash four shifts, the number four. Um, but it's been a blast, right? So like we, you know, the wonderful part about Zoom is breakout groups, of course. Mm -hmm. So very quickly, as you know, as much as possible, like you said, get them busy, get them active, get them hands on. So introduce the section of the protocol, student agency, right? Okay, great. Here's a lesson. Let's watch it together. All right, in your breakout group, go redesign. Um, and so we did that for two days, just kind of became acquainted with the different parts of the protocol. But then on the third day, they bring their they brought their own lessons. Um, and we did redesign triads and I put them in the thirds and it could have been, you know, and they were bringing like that crappy remote lesson that I want help with from the spring yeah. or something I'm really hoping to launch my kids with in the fall or whatever, right? But crappy was their term, not mine. Um, and it was, you know, the instructional conversations that happen when we get educators together and we give them some kind of structure and some kind of protocol and something to sink their teeth into to structure the work, right? Um, and I am continually astounded by how powerful those conversations are you know and it's so much better than the sit and get pd right i mean get right. educators together they're smart they're talented they have expertise and experience give them something to work around and design around and turn them loose and the conversations that i've heard and had the last two weeks have just been so rewarding um as these educators get at it Right, because they know like this didn't feel right. right. Like, you know, we know when we experience that great learning, we know when we get it from our students and we just think this didn't feel right, but it's not always clear what to do next. And that's why I love the protocol is you can really help people see 
what am I doing well? Right? Like what are some things that are going well? What are some things that I want to work towards? And being able to look through that lens is, is super helpful. I, I love that. Um, and too often we don't create the time for people to bring their own lessons and create. And so you like have all these great ideas and then you leave and you're like, Oh yeah, school started. What was that thing I was supposed to do? <laughs> and it just, you know, it's so overwhelming that we don't have enough time to really do the deep planning. And so as much as we can embed it into the days right. um, and the time that we're actually doing the work, it's so much more impactful. Yeah. So Katie, here's a thought for you. So I'm working with a school district out east um, and I'm working with their leadership team. It's both building level and district level admins. And we've got it set up so it's um, five two-hour sessions synchronous where we talk about things. But then there's also uh, a two-hour asynchronous block in between each one of those or after each one of those so sort of this blend of synchronization synchronous that you talked about right yep. and so on and i as i have put that structure together it has um really resonated with me again how appreciative i am of my professional learning network my online community of learners that has just fed me resources for many years right mm -hmm. and you know and i know that you're appreciative of your pln as well so much uh, they make us smarter every day, right? Yep. Um, and yet I also know that somehow, you know, as we advocate for teachers to create their own PLNs and become connected and learn how to be good curators of resources, that they were also awash with a million zillion resources in the yeah. spring about things they could use and tools to try and, you know, whatever. And it was just very overwhelming. And I wonder, you know, it feels like the ongoing task of helping teachers become good curators and creating good global communities uh, has never been more important and yet is, maybe has never also been more challenging. Thoughts on that? Yeah, yes, I just, I agree with you 100%, but as you're talking, it also reminds me of how important that is for educators to do that for our students. And so often we think I have to curate everything and I have to be the one to find all this stuff. And so educators will spend their you know, days and nights finding the right resource for kids. Here's the right thing, read it, answer this question and move on. Instead, what if our days were really helping kids pull out the right resources and think about how they learn and how they navigate it and make sense of those things. Um, and I, I think it's just a skill that that is so important now um and if we're not experiencing it as an adult and really trying to figure out how to do this better as adults it's hard to know how to do that for kids um you know if you saw the the stack next to me my books are not as neatly piled in this shelf behind me i have just been on this binge of all these books that i want to read and i'm pulling different things my tabs are like crazy on my computer there is so much great information that i'm but I, I hit a point of overload when I'm like, oh, I want this. I want to, I want to take this in. And we also just need time to like, stop. <laughs> There's your, I'm on information overload and I need to be able to process and th synthesize. Um, and so modeling that also for educators in our professional learning, I think is, is really important. Um, and, you know, so much again on the curriculum side, we're so focused on having all of these right resources or, up digitizing the curriculum instead of saying i mean frankly if we paid attention in the last six months a lot of stuff that's in our history books might be outdated i mean it's definitely outdated and not as relevant so how do we leverage what we have to make sense of um and make meaning i think is really really important yeah absolutely and i appreciate you sticking up for the students you know i think we know that our kids are passionate about things um whether it's you know, quilting or rock climbing or yeah. some sports team that they care about or they want to become better writers or they want to become better at this video game or, you know, whatever. Um, and we sort of just kind of leave them on their own, right? Like, yeah. you're on your own to go find the relevant communities. Hey, I know you like to code. Guess what? There's some amazing communities out there for coders, but we're not going to do anything to connect you to those because it's not part of the curriculum and we don't think it's you know it's not part of the skill sets that we think we're supposed to prepare you for as a school district so we ignore that when right. what a powerful thing it would be for kids to come to us and say i really am interested in this right and then you say awesome let's figure right. out how you can dive deep in that and find the other people who care about it and are passionate about that, right? And there's so much sort of this stranger danger mentality still in schools. Oh, we, 
couldn't connect that you know young programmer to adult coding communities because something bad might happen right and we feels like we're just really doing kids a disservice i couldn't agree more i'm just thinking as you're saying this uh my son has been into Minecraft. And it's been actually great because he's been connecting with friends that he wouldn't be able to see and they they chat and stay up to date and just he gets that social interaction and it like for him that he, he enjoys it. And so all of a sudden he wants Minecraft books. So I ordered him these books and he's been just like devouring them. And he's been doing a lot of research online. He loves the voice to text command. So he, you know, when he wants to figure something out, he yeah. searches it on YouTube and he watches all these videos. Then he tries and puts it into practice. And yesterday he said, you know, I think I could write one of these Minecraft guides. And I was like, I, I think you probably could. He goes, you know, the ones I want aren't here. I want to write it. What's the process? And just that something he's interested in, something he's motivated in at a time where we're saying these kids are so disengaged, they don't want to do anything. They, they do and could if we provide them the right time and space. And I think the other part that I learned about that from a teacher's perspective is when I was teaching my online course, I just eliminated a class and did check-ins with people. And it was, I'm like, why have I not done this before? Right? Just that one-on-one -on -one check in is so valuable and it can do those things like with my son, Zach, it can help us understand what are you interested in? What's motivating you? What do you need help with? What resources can I connect you with rather than like, let's check and see if you did everything right. You know? Yeah, absolutely. So Katie, you've been very generous with your time today. I don't want to take too much time. What else is in your head? Uh, a lot. One of the things, I am really just passionate about, and I think there's an opportunity to, to really think about is our, our focus on accountability. So having this conversation and not really thinking or at least pushing on how do we hold people accountable in a remote environment or in a new world without standardized tests or when I can't see you teaching. And I, um, I'm hearing a lot of people just talk about, like, can I drop in on lessons? You know, like this, like in the, the instruction or the leadership um, check in and also how we hold kids accountable. And I just, I urge people to be thinking about how do we really focus on what matters <laughs> and, um, and really think about how we, we, we work on that. And the last thing I'll just push on is, We've been saying, you and I both have been saying forever, and so has much, many of our, our friends in the collective ecosystem, that we're trying to prepare kids for a world that's unpredictable, right? We're here. Like, it is in our face. The unpredictability of our world is here. And, you know, we've been saying it as rhetoric for so long. And now it's like, this is why we're doing that is because the world, nothing is certain. We can't predict that we're going to be going to school in the fall and that it's going to be as it always was. So how do we rethink our goals, our curriculum, our resources, our accountability so that it mirrors what we say we want for kids, not just what we've always done? Yeah, no, absolutely. I've been having some really fun conversations with teachers this week and last from Virginia where they will come and say like, well, but my district does scripted curricula. My district mm -hmm. has scripted lessons. I said, so I would throw up some list of 21st century competencies like critical thinker, problem solver, communicator. Yeah. Type of and I was like, so how does your district feel about those? Oh, they say they want those too, right? I say, okay, great. Well, then there's your opening, right? Because now you can take that list and you can go to your leaders and say, where is this in the scripted curriculum? Because mm -hmm. I'm having trouble seeing it, right? So, and by the way, if you want to make some space for that, I'm the first volunteer, right? <laughs> so um, these are, Accountability decisions are tough because everybody feels victimized by mm -hmm. policy mandates or, you know, testing mandates or whatever. Um, we did see a few systems in the spring when they were freed from those mandates, see that as an opportunity to experiment and try stuff. Yeah. But I don't think most people did. And it's so, I don't know how many districts are moving in the direction that you and I wish they would go, Katie, about rethinking accountability and, you know, learner competencies and yeah. graduate outcomes. I think so many want to, Scott, and what I really want to push is to your point, when the conversation you're having with teachers say there's an opening. When I've talked, principals will say, my teachers won't do it, I wish they would. Superintendents say, oh, I can't get my principals to do that. Teachers will say, but my superintendent won't let me. 
right? Or no, our parents would never do it. So we're just in a space of pointing fingers. So I would just encourage everyone, if you have an idea, if you, have, if you want to try something that you believe is gonna be better for kids, please try it. Please, and, and, then, and then go and talk to somebody about it and say, here's why I'm doing it. Here's, here's the goal, here's the outcome. Instead of just assuming people don't want us to or locking our doors, let's start talking about it. Let's start sharing it. And if we don't create a new accountability system now, we're gonna miss our window. Um, Tony Wagner, great advocate. He's you know, got a really, a new book, his memoir, but he did the New Way Forward Summit with us. Yeah. And um, I just, I think there's an opportunity again to think about the accountability 2.0. How do we create the system now in lieu of one that exists? Otherwise we're gonna have um, people who benefit testing companies and other organizations who will find a way to to bring it back if we don't find a better way. Yeah, no, absolutely. So, you know, one of the things we know about um, systems change is that it's not linear. It doesn't just happen at a constant rate. We have these- I really wish it did though. <laughs> <laughs> we have these moments of uh, punctuated equilibrium, right? And then we have these windows of opportunity that open up where if we take advantage of them, we can actually move systems quite quickly to a different place. Yeah. Uh, Kurt Lewin, the old organizational leadership guy, talked about how you unfreeze your organization, move yourself forward, and then freeze it again at the new desired point, which I think is a great way to think about that. So, you know, a lot of people have been talking about this summer being one of those windows of opportunity around racial justice, for example, right, um, and, and equity concerns. But we also have the same opportunities around learning and teaching, like you said, if we take advantage of them. Yeah. I just Absolutely. wish I was hearing from more districts they were thinking that way rather than not just trying to return back to what was. Yeah. And Scott, I think that's where we have the unique opportunity and um, an obligation in a way to provide those models and support, not being mired in the, the messiness of districts and state politics right now. Like the leadership, I just want to give like the teachers have been doing an amazing job, but the leadership, the weight on their shoulders is massive. Right. And so to the extent that we collectively in this ecosystem can be there to lift up and support these schools and districts and teachers, I think it's our obligation to really help people lift their head up, support yeah. them and, and give them resources and, um, and models to, to go to, which is why, again, your framework is awesome. The, the four shifts um, and more things like that, that can help people think about what that system looks like in its next incremental phase. Yeah, like you try to provide lots of models and exemplars and sort of the what could you do with this or what thinking does this inspire? Mm -hmm. um, you know, Katie, one of the things that I confess I've been struggling with is equity um, this summer because among yeah. one of the other things we didn't do this summer is we didn't solve device and internet bandwidth equity yeah. issues um, in most places. And so a lot of the stuff that you and I talk about, particularly for remote, is dependent on some technology. So, and I don't really know what to do about that. <laughs> it's a, a big issue. Yeah, it's it's heavy on my heart often, um, you know, and not just this summer. But I think the the device part is is only a small fraction of the equity and access and opportunity gap, and it is important, and people are addressing it. But what I've heard and breaks my heart is that we can't provide meaningful experiences for our kids because not everybody have, has access. And that mentality is, is not gonna help us. And thinking about how can we set the sights high? How can we hold our expectations high? And then figure out how to go to people who don't have the access and provide it for them. So if, again, that's where some kids need to be in school, most kids need to be at home. Let's, let's set the expectation high, let's provide as much support, parents who can support kids, let's keep them at home, and let's bring kids into school who don't have those devices, who don't have access, who don't have guidance and support or supervision, and let's bring them in and support and nurture them in ways that they don't have the opportunity at home because of, um, of the conditions and families working in community context, I think matters a lot. And not stop working to make sure that all of our kids have devices. And there's no reason, a lot of schools even told me they had devices but didn't send them home. <laughs> right so it's like let's let's get over the fact that we're going to lose like let's send all of the devices home as much as possible let's work with communities to provide internet access and let's not let that be the barrier 
to provide meaningful and authentic experiences for kids. I think the other thing that's important to call out is there's a lot of families. These learning pods are starting to emerge. Yeah. Um, as parents are saying, we have to take um, the situation into our own hands because we need to go to work and we want our kids to be in community learning together. And what I don't want to happen is parents with resources and access be the only ones who have those opportunities to provide those for kids. So I would love to think about school districts. How do you provide pods? How do we work with boys and girls clubs and you know other organizations to provide those hubs of support for, for kids whose um, families might not be able to provide them? Yeah, I think I saw a news story today that San Francisco is trying to do something like that, where they create some community yeah. community-based hubs at the community center or the Y or the library, whatever, and yeah. very, very equity-focused, like you talked about. I think you know the challenge, of course, in all school systems is that as much as we would like to think that we're equity-focused, um, it's really the high-achieving families with the most you know social capital um, who complain the loudest and get the most attention. Um, and so, you know, it'll be interesting to see how many districts actually take us up on um, whatever return plans we have and putting an equity lens on those as opposed to just listening to the loudest, uh, most affluent complainers. Yeah. And really, you know, I, I've been doing a lot more learning this summer and I have a lot more to learn um, in general. But, you know, when we think about for me, being learner-centered is very much with an equity lens. And how do we make sure that it's not just everyone gets the same thing, but how do we make sure that every kid feels loved, cared about, valued for who they are and what they come with? And I just think if we don't start there with our schools and we don't have kids who know that they matter and that the experiences that they've had over the last six months are valid and valuable, um, I think we're going to be missing out on a huge opportunity. And, you know, the other thing we keep hearing is the COVID slide and these kids are going to be so far behind. And you and I both know that kids have always been in different places. They've always come to school with, you know, jagged profiles. So how do we not just say you're behind, we're going to double up on curriculum and make sure you have all these, you know, these learning experiences, but how do we say, what did you learn? What are you interested in learning? What do you, what do you now want to know more about? Um, I think that's another opportunity too, to really rethink the equity lens and be more culturally, culturally responsive um, to the kids and, and what, they, what they know, how they learn, and how they um, want to continue to grow. Yeah, absolutely. And that assets-based approach is going to really help us in terms of student-driven and student-directed learning at home and the engagement and motivation that goes with it. Plus, it also, you know, I think you and I are cognizant of the fact that those learning loss benchmarks are pretty um, arbitrary, arbitrary. Way, right? Um, yeah. And politically determined. And there is no, like, you know, universal law of where kids should be at a certain age in a certain sure. subject. Like, that's all, you know, just stuff we made up. And then, Yeah, but there's such a fear. There is this, like, paralyzing fear for parents. And I don't know how, I often, I'm in these conversations with friends, like, what do you think they're actually losing? I mean, so yes, their skills and like foundational skills and I want kids to be reading and writing, absolutely. But they are, they are arbitrary benchmarks based on this like laundry list of standards, not necessarily where kids need, need to be. Yeah, absolutely. Katie, it feels like that's a good stopping point. Um, I, again, you know, just a couple of days ago, I was like, hey, you want to chat? And are you game for recording it? And you took me up on the offer, and I really appreciate it. Um, Always. Thanks for your time on this Friday, and uh, let's do this again sometime. It was really fun. Definitely. Thanks, Scott. Thank you, Katie. Have a great weekend. Bye. You too. Bye.